Welcome back to Thoughts from the Movies. I am your host, Josh L. Sass. With me, as always, is Justin Luteran and Austin Moorhead. Um, this week, we discuss the 1982 classic from Sidney Pollock, uh, <laughs> Tootsie, starring Dustin Hoffman. <laughs> Sidney Pollock. Sidney Pollock, not Pollock. <laughs> Pollock's a Polish person. <laughs> Sidney Pollock. Damn it, How do you say it? Sydney Pollock. Sydney oh, the Pollock. Oh, I see what I did wrong here. <laughs> Sydney the Pollock. He's sorry, great. everybody. <laughs> Didn't mean to be accidentally racist. No, no, it's funny. He's from Indiana, though, so I think it's probably okay. All right. Uh, um, yeah. So this was Justin's pick. Um, a '80s. I I I. I winced to say 80s comedy classic because Dustin Hoffman's the star of it. Um, and from everything I read about the background of it, his and Sydney's. Sydney? Is that at least right? Sydney? Sydney, yeah. Okay. His Good job. And Sydney's um, intentions were to make this a somewhat of a drama that it has humorous moments. Um, so Justin, like, why why did we watch Tootsie? You know what? Tootsie was just one of the ones. Uh, honestly, like, I'm kind of running out of stuff on Netflix to see that I haven't seen, and it was on there, and I know it's kind of regarded as a classic. Like, for a long time, I was kind of, like, not really into it. I'm like, eh, it doesn't sound all that great. But we got to a point where I'm just like, I need stuff to watch. And it's got all these Oscar nominations. Dustin Hoffman's obviously amazing. Um so it was just kind of like, I didn't really know anything about it. Just took a whim on it. And what we got was, uh, was surely something. Um, what did you guys, did you guys know of it? Had you heard about it? Like, was it on your radar at all? Or was it just kind of like, what the hell is this thing? I think for me, and I, I feel like this immediately put the negative connotation on it. And I don't want that. But like, this is one of my mom's favorite movies. Like, my mom references it. My mom loves it. I told her we were so, watching it. She's like, oh, I love it. It's great. You're going to be so excited to see it. Right. So my like, mom's the same way. Um, so I was aware of it. Um, and obviously, I'm aware of Dustin Hoffman, uh, you know, The Graduate. Um, what else? Uh, Rain Man. Uh, Kramer versus the, Kramer. Yep. What's the one in the, like, the, in the 70s? He did Kramer versus Kramer with Meryl Streep at the end of the 70s. Midnight Cowboy. Midnight Cowboy. That's the yeah. other one. 70s? Yeah. 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 So, like, you know, I'm well aware of Dustin Hoffman's work. And, like, I think I even said when you said Dustin Hoffman, I was like, oh, I love Dustin Hoffman. So, like, to see him play a woman, <laughs> that yeah. was awesome. Right? Was Austin, were you, was this on your radar at all before we started watching it? Or? You know, man, I'm going to be straight up honest. I had not heard of this film at all. And the only reason that I knew it, like when I was watching it, so this is going to sound really stupid, but Family Guy, the TV show, had based an episode off of this movie. And I looked at it and I was like, why does this seem, why is this so familiar? Like the the names, the the angles that they're doing. And I was like, Holy shit, Family Guy did an episode about this, and I remembered it. <laughs> Who played the Tootsie character? Was it Peter? Uh, no, it was, um, it was uh, Stewie. He had, he had <laughs> auditioned for, like, a, uh, a children's show, and they didn't have any more roles for boys. So he okay. came in in the same attire, like, no joke, like, glasses and everything. And the little girl that he, like, ends up having a crush on is yeah. named Julie. So <laughs> wait a sec. I think I remember that episode. Was that was that one of like the early runs, like back in the yeah before that's, the show, that's like a, when it was first getting started? I right. feel like I've seen that before, but I haven't watched Family Guy for a while, so it has yeah. to be a while ago. So but, it was not on my radar, but as soon as I like started into it, I was like, I know this. Like I know this is how this is gonna end, which is sad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's one of those ones that's a little bit understated as far as, like, the 80s. You know, the 80s was a decade that was defined by a lot of big franchises. You know, Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Terminator, and stuff like that. And uh, I think if you look at, like, the Oscar movies of the 80s, that's kind of a weaker decade that, like, people don't know a lot of the movies that ended up winning or getting nominated in that decade. So I think this one was kind of a, a bit of a one that flew under the radar for a lot of people, probably. Um, 
But, and it was interesting, Josh, what you said about being a drama, because I think uh, one of the things they wanted to do with it was um, shoot it sort of seriously and then just let the humor be in the situations that they were in, but not try to make it a comedy, which is something that a lot of comedians or people that make comedic films have said uh, recently, like Judd Apatow and Seth Rogen. They say, like, we just try to make really good human stories and not try to be funny necessarily. Like, we want to make a good dramatic film that has the right uh, the right structure of a movie and has really good emotional backstory and beats and things like that. Not necessarily just try to make something funny. So this movie, I, I remember reading that Sydney and Dustin and the crew were trying to make it more serious and just let the situations be the humor themselves as opposed to trying to be funny. Well, and it's just, it stands out as kind of a weird movie for even Sydney, like The Fugitive, uh, Eyes Wide Shut. Like, you know what I mean? Like these are award-winning Oscar nominated films. So to have like Tootsie in the middle of it is just like a weird, just doesn't make sense. Yeah, I mean, he in his movies in the 70s, he did a lot of really big, well-known movies, but not really in the genre. He did The French Connection, he did The Exorcist, he did Network, which were all very, you know, action, horror, uh, thriller, you know, type of movies, very heavy on drama. So I don't know if he had done comedy before this necessarily. But, and again, this, you know, it is technically a comedy, but it's, you know, more of like the romantic drama that just has some humor in it. Um, right. Did you guys like, did you think it was funny? I definitely laughed out loud a couple of times. But... Oh, a number of times. I, yeah. I, was, I just had it on while I was talking to Austin, getting everybody ready. And I like, I was cackling. Like, I mean, there's just really, there's some amazing parts of it. Where was, uh... hang on a second. I definitely oh. laughed when he was in, he's in the dressing room with Gina Davis and he's reading her the lines and he's like, the tips, the tits. Tips, the tits, tits. I like the, uh, uh, I would like to make her look a little more attractive. How far can you back off? How about Cleveland? Like, just, um, just like classic 80s, like, jokes all the way through. <laughs> that was one that got me for sure. And, and I love that, especially like, uh, and it was really interesting. I read in the, the little notes that Bill Murray removed his name from the, the credits. Like that, like in the trailers, because they didn't want people to think it was a Bill Murray movie. But there's definitely a lot of like Bill Murray esque moments in there that make it like funny, but also heartfelt at the same time. Uh, like when Bill Murray's playing the silent violin during the party at the beginning, like that's awesome. That's just Bill Murray being Bill Murray. But like a lot of the setup punchline stuff felt very Ghostbusters, you know, kind of like here's a smart ass answer for something, you know, that's a real question, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the movie. I won't lie to you. Like I'm a sucker for an eighties comedy romance movie. Um, like I love all of the, um, my brain is not working today, boys. I'm sorry. Um, John Hughes movies. I love all of the Bill Murray movies, Tom Hanks movies, like all those, like, that kind of genre I'm a sucker for. And uh, this is just right up that alley. Uh, I think uh, I had to laugh out loud near the end with Bill Murray's line. He's just watching TV. He's like, yeah, that's a nutty hospital. <laughs> and I just, I was just like, of course, of yeah. course they have to leave Bill Murray the last line for that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know I guess... that line, that line is one of the more popular ones of the film. Yeah. I know it's funny. Cause I didn't know Bill Murray was in it at all. I had no idea. Nope. So that was a nice, pleasant surprise but he also does play a little off character in that he's a he's a side character right and b he's just more serious and kind of like curmudgeonly you know and not goofy slapstick funny happy-go-lucky bill murray he's just kind of like the, yeah especially the early bill in the murray. Background. yeah early bill murray is definitely a lead character normally and and it has the majority of the dialogue and and it's the Dan Aykroyds of the world that are supposed to fill in the, you know, the punchlines and stuff. But, like, he does so well at it. Like, he, he killed it. Like, anything Bill Murray is challenged with, he nails it. Um, I guess, like, just like most Bill Murray movies, all of his lines were improvised. Uh, like, <laughs> he was just being him. Um, which is, like, it's crazy to think that, like, in a movie that stars... Dustin Hoffman and Gina Davis were still talking about Bill Murray. 
<laughs> yeah. I just proved how, how good Davis's he is. First movie, I think. I think that was her first role. She looked young. That wouldn't surprise me. Um, yeah, I remember seeing in the dressing room. I'm like, man, is that Jamin and Davis? That's yeah, yeah. All right, so well, let's go over the plot of it real quick, just for those if anyone's watching who doesn't know. Tootsie is um, Dustin Hoffman plays a struggling actor who is a very sort of volatile guy. He's got a big personality, and that causes a lot of problems with the people he works with. And his agent basically tells him, "No one wants to work with you, dude. You're not going to get any work." at all people are done with you and he's trying to raise money to put on bill murray's play that he wants to be in so his motivation is to help his his roommate slash friend get his play made so he decides to dress as a woman to get a role on a soap opera um since he thinks no one will hire him as he is michael dorsey as a man he becomes dorothy michaels this southern elderly woman with a lot of like feist and zest to her and uh you know people love her so I think the, the obvious one, the obvious first um, comparison, right, is Mrs. Doubtfire. So do you guys, did you think about that movie while you were watching this? Or no. was there any point in time after that you were kind of comparing the two? Or No. There, Go ahead, Austin. There's a point where I knew that this movie came out earlier than Mrs. Doubtfire. And I wondered if the success of this film is the reason why they decided to roll with that plot of Mrs. Doubtfire, which I know that people hold them regards and we'll get into another discussion later about which one is better. But overall, like I thought that I was like, I wonder if they like used any like things for this movie to correspond and make Mrs. Doubtfire. It probably, I'm sure it gave them confidence. I mean, I think that was probably about a decade later, but this one was a big success both critically and commercially. So I'm certain that it would have been uh, a little bit of a confidence boost to them. Yeah. Because that's, you know, that's one thing people do when they're making movies is they always look back at comps, which are similar films and how they did at the box office. And that's something that people at the studio use to decide if it looks like it's going to make money or if other movies like this have not done well in the past. So when they looked at this, I'm sure it would definitely give them a little bit of a, you know, boost of confidence to make Mrs. Doubtfire. Man, Doubtfire, though, is a decade later. It has uh chris columbus uh, maybe i don't know maybe it's kind of the same i just feel like chris columbus was already known for a family comedy kind of like you know he does home alone jumanji honey i shrunk the kids casper like uh hulk did he gremlins did he do gremlins gremlins he he's like kind of known for that whereas like again sydney and hoffman that's not their wheelhouse Right? right, Robin Williams and Chris Columbus at that point, that's kind of their wheelhouse. Uh, so I just think that that's kind of like, yeah, Austin, there's definitely like, you have to give it like what it is, right? Like it's a guy in drag, like pretending. Um, but like, I don't know. It just feels like Mrs. Doubtfire is its own category because it's it's meant to be a family comedy it's not raunchy it's not is more of like you said with the drama aspect with the comedy going on right doubtfire is written as a comedy and performed as a comedy right i mean i think that comes into the robin williams of it all like when you have him attached you kind of know what you're getting as far as I mean, he's done dramatic work, certainly, and he's a, I think he was a very fantastic actor, but, you know, that was his bread and butter, was Dustin Hoffman was a little bit um, of a more serious sort of, you know, heavier type of roles as an actor. Well, and, like, Dustin Hoffman, like, I didn't realize is one of the leads in Kung Fu Panda, so that's hilarious. <laughs> um, yeah, and then later he, down the line in his career, yeah. Yeah, but he was, like, go on to do some, like, more lighthearted stuff, and I wonder how much Tootsie had to do with that. Yeah. Like, he even shares the screen with Robin Williams as Hook. He's Captain Hook. Yeah. Oh, his career gets – he opens up, he gets way goofy. Like, he does Mr. Megorium's Wonder Emporium, which is yep. just a total I, kids. Like I knew you were going to bring that one up. And uh, even Meet the Fockers, which my parents also love, is, like, pure comedy. Um, so, yeah, he, he definitely branched out, I think, uh, a little bit after this. But probably earlier in his career it was less so about a, a wider range of things. Let right. me ask you guys this, because this is something that I thought about in terms of the comparison between the two, Mrs. Doubtfire and Tootsie, right? One of the things about Tootsie that I, I'm not going to say it bothered me, but I think Mrs. Doubtfire did a little better is that at the beginning when he's talking to his agent, who is played by the director, Sidney Pollack, and he's saying, you're never going to work again. And he goes, huh? And then it's like, boom, cut yes. to, he's, he's Dorothy Michaels full 
full in drag walking down the street and his character's like already created. And I think what I liked about Mrs. Doubtfire is they showed how he got to be that character a little more. Like they have him figuring out his voices on the phone and like trying out the different wigs and makeups and things where like in Tootsie, there was a scene later where it showed him getting into gear. Eight before. minutes later. Yeah. But it's I like, timed it. He just like went from Dustin Hoffman to immediately that character with the look and the voice and the attitude and everything with like no bridge to it. So it, it didn't bother me, but I liked, I think it worked better as a story point in Mrs. Doubtfire where they showed him becoming Mrs. Doubtfire and Agreed. not just like Robin Williams, Mrs. D Doubtfire, you know, right back to back next to each other. Yeah, I agree. It bothered me. It's, it's probably the only thing in the movie that really bothered me. Like deep down, like, like, it's not exactly the prettiest movie I've ever seen. It's not necessarily, like, the best acted movie I've ever seen. But, like, that in particular felt like such a weird, like, contrast in just storytelling. Like, it didn't make any sense why they would do it later. Other than that, like, they're trying to maybe show he's getting more into it. But, like, I don't know. There needed to be at least a scene where he's like sitting alone in his apartment or talking to Bill Murray's character. He's like, I'll be a woman. You know what I mean? Like that right. needs to happen. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, because without that, you don't even know who this person is like walking down. I mean, you assume it's him because it's panned in on the camera, but if nobody even knew like any backstory behind what was going into this character, they're going to think, Oh, that's a little weird. Who's that? And then they find out later. I think it's not a slap in the face, but I think it like, I don't know. I don't know what I'm yeah. trying to say here. Or yeah. like, if, if, you, if you were watching this movie on TNT, right? And like, you came in right at the scene where it's just that woman walking down the street. Like, that'd be a huge twist to you, like, ten minutes later when you find out it's a woman or it's a man. Like, yeah, what yeah. movie is this? And at the end, they didn't, like, they could have even just thrown some, a little line in the office, like, you know, I don't know, Dustin Hoffman could have been like, so they won't hire me as me, as Michael Dorsey, or, you know, something like that. And then you can just like see the gears start to turn how he gets from man, Michael Dorsey, not getting any work to female Dorothy Michaels. But there's like, there's just no bridge to it at all. Like it's very right. abrupt. And, and I, I mean, it didn't bother me, I think, cause I liked it so much. Like when he was first walking down the street, I'm like, man, like he looks good. And like his character, like I, I dig it. Like, I think I was just so into it. That's why it didn't bother me. Well, I guess, um, so like, you know, because he's Dustin Hoffman. Um, he, like, took this role super seriously, right? Where, like, you had to address him as Dorsey when he was in, in costume, as in drag. They would, uh, on set, if something bad happened, they would wait till he was in drag to tell him something bad happened because he was nicer as Dorsey. Um, he took Dorsey out for a spin, convincing, like, all the teachers at his daughter's school that that was it, her aunt. Like, I mean, he really, yeah. he, like, hit on another actor in an elevator and then, like, made fun of him later. Like, I mean, it, he really got into the character. Dustin Hoffman's reputation as an actor is that he is very volatile and can be tough to work with and is very much like the guy he was shown to be in the first part of the movie where, like, he's being difficult with the director or he's being very specific about certain things for a long time was that way so i can see why they would have waited till he was you know in his character as dorothy to tell him bad news or to do things why like would that. a tomato sit down i play the best vegetables on broadway that's <laughs> <laughs> like what a great yeah. line i don't know what does that even mean yeah i play the best vegetables on broadway so he gets this role, right, as the on the soap opera as Dorothy Michaels, as playing like, you know, this not taking any crap, firm, you know, older Southern Belle type of female. And like everyone on the show is a, a total sexist, the director and like the stars and everything. It's like he's Jessica Lang, who plays a nurse on the uh, show, which is called something hospital, Southview Hospital or something like yeah. that. Yeah. So she plays a nurse and then he falls, starts to fall for her as they hang out more and as they bond him as Dorothy and her as herself, obviously. Um, Jessica Lang, by the way, babe, man, <laughs> mega babe. Yeah. Really but did like, nothing after this. She was nobody she, after this. She was in this thing a couple years ago called a uh, feud, Joan and Betty, which was, I don't know if it was a limited series or if it was on Netflix, but it was, I think it was Emmy nominated and it was like based on a true feud from past Hollywood. 
But um, yeah, She's between also that an American Horror Story, she's one of the mains yeah. in American was, Horror Story. That was what I took from this. I took from because I watch American Horror Story all the time, and I I I took because I didn't like look at the cast or anything before I watched this film. And I said, "Holy shit, that's Jessica Lange! Wow." <laughs> <laughs> who, does she, who does she play in American Horror Story? What's her role? Is she like a witch or like what's her She's role? She's like one of the reoccurring. So you know how American Horror Story takes the same cast and they just change their roles? Sure, yeah. Yeah, so she, he's, she's a bunch of different things. Yeah. She's one of the leads. She's in every, every series. It was just crazy to see how like, how, because she's always, because just with age and everything, she was like the older person and to see her like young in this right. man wow <laughs> yeah very surprised and, and i was also surprised that she hadn't done as much as i thought in between like bigger things because jessica lang was like when i saw that it was her i'm like oh that's a big name like i know that name but then looking over her filmography there wasn't actually as many big highlights as i kind of thought which surprised me and she was great in this movie she was really great and i think she won the oscar for best supporting actress in this movie deservedly so yeah really i think yeah of of all i think it was nominated for 10 and that was the only one that it won though i'm looking at oscar awards now yeah oscars best picture i can understand why it'd be a best picture nominee yeah she won for best actress in a supporting role i what you don't like that oh no i don't like that who else was she against it must have been a weak class that year no offense to her but like (laughs) <laughs> best supporting actress in a uh, supporting role yeah. in 82 yeah like i don't know like glenn close lost to her but the world according to garp like what How's, i don't know what that is <laughs> like what is that exactly that's like the eight that's like all of the 80s oscar movies you're like what are you talking about <laughs> who were uh, who are the other best picture let's see here now i'm like did, like, Dustin Hoffman get nominated? Yeah, okay, and he lost. He got nominated, yeah. Ben Kingsley won for Gandhi. That's, well, that's cheating. <laughs> that's not yeah. even. Yeah, well, she wasn't up against him, though. No, <laughs> Dustin Hoffman was. Oh, yeah, yeah. So The World According to Garp was actually a film with Robin Williams in it. I saw that. Yeah. Uh, E.T. came out the same year. Mm-hmm, okay. So Spielberg lost Best Director to... Who, Justin? Uh, what was the film? Tell me the film. I'll tell you the director. Okay. Uh, the film is Gandhi. Hmm. I want to say Anthony Minghella, but that's not right. Who no. Uh, I'll give you a hint. Uh, in Jurassic Park, he carries a uh, cane with the the mosquito oh, in it. Oh, Richard, Richard Amborough. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. I forgot he was a director before he was an actor. How pissed was Spielberg? Like, he's like, he's so mad. He's like, you beat me for best director. Now you're going to be in my movie. Yeah. Suck it. But that's the thing. Like, so the 80s is those types of movies, you know, those big Spielbergian, like those, those types of movies. Right. Not, you're not thinking of like, you know, out of Africa and Gandhi and like, you know, those type of things when you're thinking about the 80s movies, which is always interesting to me. It's a separate tangent, but you know, as far as the Oscars goes, it's a very interesting decade. Oh, man. Okay, so best picture, it was Tootsie, Gandhi, Missing, The Verdict, and E.T. I would be, like, if I was Spielberg, I would have been flipping over tables. I don't <laughs> even know what half those movies are. I don't know what Missing or The Verdict are. No, and E.T. is iconic. Yeah. Although sci-fi movies at the Oscars have a very poor track record. I don't think a sci-fi, I don't know if a sci-fi movie has ever won best picture. And certainly they don't get nominated very often. Was that? Uh, I'm just really pissed at you for calling E.T. a sci-fi movie. Yeah, it's definitely a sci-fi. It's a sci-fi family comedy. I don't know what you'd call it. Was that I'd called amazing. I'd was call that it amazing. Shape of, was that Shape of Water nominated? Because that's technically. It was, but it didn't win. Shape of Water, it won. Yeah, it won. Best it picture. won? Best yeah. picture? Yeah. Huh. I was going to say, I had to think about that one for a second, all the sci-fi movies that went there. Well, then, yeah. So you got to be Gamicio. Just nail it. I like it. Um, all right. Let's get back on Tootsie. Let, so let me ask you guys this, which I – this was something that I found very interesting about the movie because especially in Hollywood the last couple of years we've been dealing with, 
the Time's Up movement and the Me Too movement and a lot of uh, sexism charges being brought to the forefront and the whole gender parity and equality and all these things is very prevalent out here. Um, and uh, it shows in the work that people are doing. It shows in the roles and the, the stories that are being told and all these different things. And this was a movie that sort of approached that 40 years ago where Dustin Hoffman is in a world surrounded by sexists and misogynists. And he tries to play this strong woman who says, I'm not going to kiss you. I'm not going to do this. Like, stop hitting on me. Stop doing this. Stop doing this. Like, he plays a very take charge sort of the type of women, woman role that is now um, a big thing. Again, like people for a while there went back to the archetypes and now they are trying to break out of that and give all women these empowered roles and things like that. And he did this a very long time ago. So um, I thought that it was interesting that it seemed like this film touched a lot of, on issues that are still relevant and being touched on today. Did you guys think about that at all? Or did you notice any of that at all? Uh, there was, um, personally, I think it's really interesting to go forward with like a feminism kind of thing with this like power for the women. But I mean, everyone in the movie know, like thinks it's a woman, but it's actually being processed through a man, which is crazy. Like it, it's always like people are trying to well, I mean, more men are doing it today where they're empowering women than they did it a long time ago. So to see that instead of like a woman powering up another woman, I mean, you even see in the, the one scene, uh, Sandy's, uh, the character Sandy, like downplays um, um, his, his character on the show, you know, because she didn't get it instead of being like, you know, like great for her and everything and all for the good of women and everything. But it's, it's a downplay, whereas you have a man in drag essentially spreading like good, positive feminism style to the movie. I thought it was incredible. I don't know if all that made sense, but. <laughs> no, it totally did. Yeah. And I think that's kind of summed up by at the end. Um, one of the other very famous lines from the movie is when Dustin Hoffman is finally, he revealed himself to Jessica Lange and they're speaking and he, he says, Oh, it's a tricky one. I got to get it right. He says, I was a better man to you as a woman than I was as a man to another woman or something like that. Do you remember that line at the end? Yeah. Yeah. It's tricky. It's trickily phrased, but he's saying that he was a better man being the woman, you know, than he was as being himself, which was very, um, I don't know. It's just interesting, you know, to see like a guy who learned so much about it. And he's he even said in interviews, like, how much he learned that he was treating women wrong in his life and like right. and missed out on a lot of cool relationships and interesting people because he'd only talked to like beautiful people or things like that. So he obviously learned a lot through it and it just felt like a really relevant film, even though it was 40 years ago. I think this is the where having a Dustin Hoffman do this role is, is where it kind of helps, right? Because he does take his roles very seriously. He's, played like later on he would go to play rain man where he's playing an autistic person um the graduate is kind of like a really weird role where he's being seduced by his girlfriend's mom and like how he's like this supposed to be this stud but he's kind of a bum like i mean he's really he really has played some deep roles before and i think if it dustin hoffman's not playing that role we get mrs doubtfire where it's totally com like if Bill Murray gets that role instead, it's mm -hmm. it's a wash. It's comedy. But yeah, it's interesting that because of Dustin Hoffman playing the role and how serious he takes it, and then like Justin said, how he went to the media and still like when he's still on like the Letterman show or whatever, like he's still talking about that stuff today that he learned in Tootsie. Um, so I think it's really an interesting point, Justin. Um, but I think it's also, I think they, they just put it on Broadway again. They just revived it in the last year or two oh, wow. or recently. So it's still on Broadway. So yeah, it's still, it's very popular and it's still remained popular throughout the past couple of decades. It's just kind of interesting though, that like, and sad, I guess, to some extent where like, there's not like even, uh, her name, uh, Jessica Lang's character isn't really that, like, she's kind of like, she's like a good like, you know, heartthrob kind of, like, actress, but she's not, like, a powerful actress like a Meryl Streep would be. Um, so it, it's just kind of sucks that, like, a women's empowerment movie 
as it may be seen now, is just all men anyway. It was written by men. It was yeah. directed by a man. It was it's leading man. Like you know what I mean? Yeah. It just sucks. Well, it's yeah. No, that's an interesting point though, because the the all the empowerment is coming from a male. And there are still like some of those stereotypes and archetypes that are presented in the movie as like, you know, the female roles who are just sort of the, like the, the girlfriend who's like the clingy, why won't yeah. you call me back, you know, blah, right. blah, blah, type yeah. of thing. Or, or even Jessica Lange's character who plays a nurse and she's, very, you know, just a mother and, you know, sort of things like that. So single mom, yeah. single mom, single mom with, with a baby that isn't hers. Like, right. Yeah. So or, it's well, like, it's, yeah, like credit. you could see the times reflected in the movie, even though like they were also trying to say all these positive things about it. Like they're trying to reverse the stereotypes while also still enforcing the stereotypes. Like it, it's very bizarre, but it's yeah, you know. yeah. It's just I mean it's it's a cool, it's a very cool movie, and I really enjoyed it. It just um, it is kind of interesting now thinking about it on that that deeper level. Exactly like what. Like, did it move things forward, or was it just a cool movie that now we retroactively try to fit into that puzzle piece shape to say that it was forward thinking? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's an interesting one because it was so long ago, and it feels like in 2020 we haven't moved all that much, you know, yeah. in in terms of moving the needle for. Um, you know, feminism and even like with racial stuff, you know, it feels like we've kind of come back to where we were a couple decades ago. So, you know, I don't do really think, know that it would have been. Do you think this movie gets made in 2020? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I think, I think movies get made like this or like this get made often. I mean, you can even see it, which is um, sometimes it can actually be annoying um, in a lot of the scripts that have come out in the last year or two, so many writers, male and female, are trying to make points about um, strong women and, and things like that, where they're being so on the nose about it and so over the top that it's actually almost a turnoff. It's like they'll put in the action or the, uh, you know, the bits of action description or lines of dialogue like, oh, you don't think because I'm a woman I can do this or like, oh, why? I'm a female. I can't do this as good as he did or look what I did, even though I'm a female. Like people are so like, I think the Hollywood movement in the last couple of years has really been looking for those stories. and it's it's been reflected in female remakes of stuff like ghostbusters and oceans eight and things like that um so i i absolutely think a movie like this could be made today there's Maybe. there's two films from uh today's age that i kind of think empower like a lot of like of the women and everything and they're it's essentially they're superhero movies it's wonder woman and uh captain marvel now a more recent some shitty movies <laughs> You're serious now, they're bad i know but um the one that was negative that kind of brings in that connotation was the that black christmas remake that they did um it had been remade twice it'll be the second remake and it was essentially uh you know the typical like story of sorority girls and everything but there's so much dialogue in it of like you know the fraternity men thinking that they're better and the women that are like well bring up all this and it's like it's just a nagging constant back and forth with it also that movie was shit by the way so don't see it it was awful <laughs> yeah it's a very it's a very fine line that you have to balance between being too on the nose and clear with your agenda but in ag or actually presenting you know a fair case for it. like i use this example all the time a movie that i think does it phenomenally is arrival you guys remember that sci-fi movie from a couple years ago mm -hmm. where amy adams plays the scientist trying to figure out the aliens language and things like that it's such a great movie and such a great role. And there's never a point where she has to tell someone like, oh, what, you couldn't get any of the men scientists to come talk to the aliens or things like that. Like there's never any of that at all, even though the role was originally written for a male and then changed to a female for Amy Adams. Like there's never anything about like showing that. It's just, it's a great role in a great movie. And it's, you know, it could have been a male or female, but she doesn't, she kills it and doesn't have to point that out at all. Like that, is, I think it's great when movies do that and just let it be what it is instead of presenting it like, hey, I'm a woman and look at all these things that I'm doing and stuff like that. Like people can be too on the nose. It's a very fine line that you have to, you have and to. This is a star-studded cast. Forrest Whitaker, uh, Jeremy Renner. Oh, you didn't see Arrival? No. 
No, you need to get in touch with this guy's movies, man. Prisoners, Arrival, Blade Runner, Sicario. This is Denny Villeneuve. He is fucking amazing. He's one of the best directors working right now. He's like way the Nolan. hell out of a scarf. I can see it. I see yeah. it. It's he's, like, he's like Christopher page. Nolan, but a little bit more cerebral. So, so he he's got a, Blade Runner. Yeah. Oh, oh, there's there's there Austin. Is. Yeah, I have Sicario, which is, I mean, he's just the guy is just so great with tension and interesting themes, and and it's just like. All of his movies have thus far been fantastic. And he's got a big movie coming out, or was supposed to come out this Christmas, which was a Dune remake um, that has an ultimate cast, Timothy Chalamet and Josh Brolin and a bunch of other, I think Jason Momoa, a bunch of other people, but that's probably going to get pushed. But you need, yeah, you guys, if anyone out there is watching this and does not know Denis Villeneuve's movies, Prisoners, Sicario, Arrival, Blade Runner 2049, this guy is fantastic. He's someone that everyone should watch. Yep. All of his movies are great. Well, there's your plug. There you go. Gotta love it. Yeah. And I know, Austin, you had mentioned Prisoners earlier um, with the Jake Hall of uh, Mystic River and all that stuff. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But um, what else did you want to talk about, Justin? Because this kind of like ended up being your movie and um, I enjoyed it. But yeah. uh, I guess maybe more to this movie's credit, I didn't pick it apart because I was just sitting there watching, you know, fun, goofy comedy. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. this totally. is an enjoyable movie. Like, I would sit down, watch this movie, and, like, waste a rainy Saturday and be just, just content watching that movie. Yeah. You know what it reminds me of? It reminded me of, like, Big. Like, there's – when you look at movies from, like, the 80s and 90s mm. that are, like, those sort of comedies with, like, yes. the, the kind of goofy soundtrack and, like, the, the story is pretty straightforward but fun and, like, totally enjoyable. Like, it, it felt like – a movie like that where it was just like you just sit with it and you're like that was really pleasant it goes down very well you know yeah. you remember it too like there's nothing super crazy fancy or like memorable about it like tootsie obviously is a great character but like the story is nothing super complex or anything like that right. but um i want to talk a little bit about i have some visuals again i brought it back this Ooh, week okay yeah, so i want to i want to talk about two things that i found really uh interesting as i was watching so I'm gonna... All right, so I'm pulling up a couple images here. And the first, there's two aspects of the look of this movie that I want to talk about with you guys. Uh, both I found interesting. One I didn't understand at all, and hopefully you guys can clarify for me. But this movie is about, it's all about femininity, right? And the female spirits and stereotypes and just, you know, what it means to be a woman and, and different things like that. So um, what I found really interesting was so much of the look of this movie is pastel colored, right? So there's a lot of pinks, there's a lot of lilacs and purples and light yellows and oranges and things like that. And I found it really interesting as I'm just gonna start scrolling through these, but if you look at all of them, you'll see it in a lot of these images. So this is, you know, from the very beginning, even the background has sort of a purplish tinge to it, right? When they're in there, uh, you know, in their restaurant where they work, they have the light blue shirts and the whites and the grays and all these things. Bill Murray has the light pink shirt. Dustin Hoffman has a light blue shirt. In the uh, birthday scene, all the colors are toned down. You have in the background, the pinks and the yellows and the blues and up here with the lavender and the violet. And this is just throughout the whole movie. Look, this girl here is wearing sort of a purplish pinkish. This guy here is very toned down, pink and blue. The whole movie has this sort of pastel-y color to it, which I don't know if like that was their idea of being feminine or like, you know, I don't want to say that's a stereotype now because it might be taken that way, but I think they were just trying to create that. Like, look at the purples and the yellows here in the background and the reds all throughout. And especially once they get to the scene, like everything is very toned down, even in, you know, the blues in the corner here, the pinks and yellows, these tans, these are all very muted, sort of fitting that pastel palette, right? Pinks and purples and whites and light blues. That's all also just the 80s. Uh, throughout the 80s. Yes. Like, um, that's just an 80s thing. Do you think so? Yeah. The 80s, I think of, like, the, the big neon colors and, like, the hair and the, you know, the sweatbands and things like that. But Yeah, a, a little bit. Um, and I think maybe, too, kind of to what your point is, is, is by making the, the pastel colors, it um, helps alleviate any idea that this is a drama, right? So it kind of helps dress it as a comedy. Uh, and maybe like then it it's easier for the drama to come through that way. I don't know. It's interesting. Keep going. And then so Bill Murray's character, he was the uh, the light pink, that hot pink before. He's got the lavender again, the purple. Once they get into the dressing room, you can see like even the lighting. It's got a pinkish purplish tinge to it, where even the walls sort of blend in with these pictures. Unicorn poster. Purple, yeah. 
her skin and the bra down here and the lighting. It's all just like across the image. Once they get on set, you have, look at these purples here, very pastel -y. Even this green, you know, is a muted green. And it all sort of, I don't want to say flat, but it definitely sort of blends together. Pinks and whites here, again with the purple. And this is just, I'll speed it up a little bit so you can kind of get a sense of, but this is just the look of the movie, right? And it's a true testament to, I think, Oh, especially once you get into this scene. Her, we'll come back to this later, but Jessica Lange's house is like the most female looking stereotype right. house you can imagine with all the different colors here. And of course the babysitter who sucks is in black because she's the worst. But um, but yeah, it's a tribute to the cinematographer Owen Roisman and the costume designer Ruth Morley and the production designer Peter Larkin who just died recently, unfortunately, to create this oh, sort of yeah. look of the film. Even again, Bill Murray with this sort of very pale orange, the pink in the background, the blinds in the wall, Again, purpley, pinkish hue to them. Um, so I just thought it was really interesting to see, like even the background, you know, of her apartment. Look at these vases that are all in the purple pink category, the couch, the flowers here. This whole image just has that tinge to it, right? And the whole movie kind of just has this. So credit to them for sort of creating this mood and this atmosphere, which culminates here at the end where this entire set is basically purple, you know, for her big reveal. But, but, um, it's just a really interesting way that people create looks and feels of movies, right? And this is all pre, this is done in, in uh, pre-production and before when you talk about how a movie is supposed to look and feel and the design aspects of it all. So just looking back fast, you can see again, the very constant color theme throughout this movie, how everything has this sort of look and feel to it. Now, another thing that really jumped out at me, and let's see that, um, so a couple of weeks ago, we had talked about the color red in Goodfellas, right? A lot of violent, bloody, aggressive reds for that movie, which is very violent and bloody and like harsh movie, right? I couldn't stop finding it in this movie in certain scenes where it got to the point where this like harsh, bright crimson was so all over the place. It seemed like they were going out of their way to put it in certain scenes. And I honestly, God, I couldn't figure out why. So as we go okay. through these, if you guys have any ideas or suggestions, throw them out there. So this is, it starts at the beginning and just goes whole way through, you'll see uh, in different areas. So this is the opening scene and he, it didn't, it didn't really hit me till a little way into the movie. You know, right now it's just a coat and this character is um, going to become sort of hostile later in the film. But right now it's just, okay, bright red right there, bright red in the second one. Yep, the curtain wise on stage and over here, it still wasn't really hitting me yet. I hadn't noticed it. Beautiful shot, by the way, that I love with have, you know, he's getting feedback from his director, you can't see, but this is actually a lot more difficult to do than people realize, but very beautiful shot here. But again, the red in the seats still hadn't really hit me yet. Even throughout the credits, we have the restaurant in that girl's dress. <clears throat> again, the very bright crimson as they're walking home, the sign is in there. Then we get to the birthday party. And I think this is where I really start to notice it because this red is so uh, aggressive and so hot that you usually use it to signify something, right? And I couldn't figure out what it was in this movie. So this, you know, this girl's wearing it. It's on the chair in this scene. In the birthday party, you have the lamp, you have the furniture, you have her outfit, you have the shoes over here. And on the corner, you have this girl's dress in red, right? Again, she's dressed in red with the balloon. Like, it feels like they're starting to go out of their way to put these harsh reds in there. Uh, you know, at her house, the whole chair and everything on it. This really harsh red in the background here like at the piano i think this is the shot where i was like man those are really starting to stick out to me like the the tab and the coke things there because you don't need to have those right and i don't know if they're Even just the thing in the background like the i'm just noticing that now like the couch or if that's yes i don't know if that is or not yeah so and it's like i don't know if they're just doing it to break up the color of this brown but they're like it's not necessary and it draws the eye you know this kind of it's such a hot fiery like harsh crimson that it, it takes your eye away from this and puts it on this right and I just started to feel like they were putting this in there and it's all over the place this is the you know where she's auditioning the whole thing is red in the background CAA this pops I mean this is still their logo and their colors right but it's just so harsh and it just if, if you like covered that up and you would see the pastels how flat this this um uh, set is right like all the other images I was showing you but that just sh it's so ostentatious and it draws the eye even here you know Sydney's got the red tie look at this thing on the desk you know it feels like they're just putting that there and I don't know why you know because if you look at the whole rest of this shot 
all very similar color tones, right? And then this thing is just so harshly standing out. I, th I was really at this point like, what are they doing with the color red here? Russian tea room, insanely hot. You know, they do a close up later where they show the window on the inside. Do you, all you of the think booth. they're doing that to break up the color scheme? Because they have so many like, what would, you know, there's not too many pastels. It's like sort of bland coloring. So they're trying to throw something vibrant in there, maybe to get attention. It's possible. But again, red is such a, it has such a strong um, psychology behind it, right? It's usually right. very lusty and very lovey or very angry, very harsh. Like there's, it's very both ends of the spectrum. -y. So I don't know, that could be why. That certainly could be why. Like, again, I, I couldn't figure out what they were trying to say. And I looked at like, I tried to find interviews with the production designer, Peter Larkin, and like see if he said anything about it, but I couldn't find any. You know, like in the, in, uh, the girl's bedroom, look at this. Like, why is this so vibrantly red and then we'll go to her bedspread over here in her pillows like the strawberries yeah. are just popping out and i'm just like I'm, I'm starting to feel at this point like overwhelmed and frustrated that i can't figure it out like is it supposed to be like they're injecting all this love into the movie like I, that doesn't really feel like the tone of the film at this point yet and then dorothy starts wearing it right she starts like almost all of her costumes are going to be either a red or a burgundy or like a you know dark purple you have the blanket here on Bill Murray too. Their couch in their apartment is again, just like they could have shot this in their apartment anywhere, but they chose to do it on the couch with this big ass red thing in the background, right? Dorothy again, dressing in this sort of like powerful red, but why is this over here? Like this thing in Jessica Lang's room. I think it actually would have been cool if like they didn't have that in the contrast of her deep red clothes with the really cool, blue of the inside of her dressing room would have been such an interesting contrast but why is this here you know like it just feels like they went out of their way to put that there and i don't get it um you know obviously looking at the jewelry that's overwhelming in that shot oops um sorry about this bar at the bottom by the way i was on netflix pulling these uh, or no i wasn't if netflix is watching the bar. but uh, again you know in the background like this this uh, piece of art you know in the girl's apartment is so hot and crimson He's still wearing it. You know, this one isn't as bright and, and noticeable, but it's still like Dorothy's color is red, right? Which, you know, when it becomes the montage of her doing the photo shoot, you go from this, boom, to this, boom, to this, boom. Like, I mean, it's just so in your face. And uh, shout out to Pittsburgh's own Andy Warhol. That's really him cameoing in the film. But, um, and obviously it goes to her iconic outfit, which is on the poster and this is in the National Museum of uh, the Museum of Modern Art or one of the museums uh, in uh, New York, I believe. And even when they're just walking down the street, look at this. Why is this here? It just feels like they're going out of their way to inject this into the movie. And I couldn't for the life of me figure it out. Um, even in a scene like this, you know, back in the bedroom, these little tinges here, these little pieces are in such contrast to everything else. And it's, I guess, maybe breaking it up a little bit keep this, going i've got it keep going you know um again she's wearing red which is fine but you know the, the curtains in the background here the accents on these curtains and it's not you know this is acceptable it's fine but these pop so much why is that you know this one a little bit more muted but still the red bow on the pink and she's wearing red again you look in the background here i mean there, obviously, with the toys, got where it. they go got on that little I'm date or whatever. I'm going to do this, Josh. I want to see if you nail it. Get back to here. I've got it. You know, okay. again, something so that wait. doesn't need to be that way, but it is. Here we go. Okay. And then, so, finally, you have the bar at the end, which is just overwhelming. But okay. So, see. this shot. Is Dustin Hoffman a girl or a man in this shot? A woman or a man? He's a man. Okay. All the way at the beginning, there's a lot of red, right? Like there's more red at the very beginning, right? She's wearing red because she's something that he, like his masculinity ruins her because all he sees her is, is a paycheck and a fuck, right? You're That's talking about why, here. Yep. That's why there's so much red, right? He's being very masculine, right? Keep going. Go to uh, T16. Okay. Notice this scene. This is the first time he reveals to his manager that he's a woman. Look at the contrast between the pink 
uh, tablecloth and the red booth, right? It's mm-hmm. kind of his two, his two worlds are starting to collide, right? They're starting to mix. Keep going. Go to a T20. Right here, the bra is literally draped over the red couch, covering up his masculinity because the transition is starting to happen. The next one, T21. First day at work, he's wearing a red dress, right? Because he's still holding on to his masculinity. Masculinity is represented in the color red. Now, as you continue down, right? <laughs> now we're starting to see this is like the final transition where he's like, I'm totally a girl now. Like, I'm totally Tootsie or whatever her, I can't ever, Dorsey or whatever. Dorsey, yeah. Go. Now it's becoming less and less. The reds are a little bit more muted, right? Now it's getting cut. Go back to the, the bed frame or the bedspread. The red masculine bedspread is covered in women's clothing, muting the red. Go one more here. Uh, like now his reds are pinks. They're not as, as red, right? His skirt is still, or the pants are still red, but now we're starting to see like the halfway transition, right? Keep going. Keep going. This scene, he's in pink and the man who's hitting on her is in red. Red is the masculinity and, and so much so that it's, um, it's threatening or overpowering. It's meant to do it on purpose, signalizing that masculinity is toxic. Wow. That oh. totally all Ooh. makes sense. What an analysis. I, but I believe it. Like, it all makes sense, too. Like, so you're saying red represents pure masculinity. And as it goes on, she sort of gets less and less, which makes sense because, you know, her big, uh, you know, A, Jessica Lang's apartment is all pinks and purples and pastel like we talked about. But then you also have at the end, Dorothy's big scene is in this purple, right? Her big reveal is... Her, she's giving her secret of masculinity to her in the present. What's in the present? I can't remember. But that represents her revealing, like she went there to yeah. reveal. Yeah. Right. And then, yeah, like her big reveal on set that she is a woman, she's like fully in the purple atmosphere, that like lavenderish atmosphere. And then can she you comes go, out. Like that's can you go represent- back one? I think it's one or two. Maybe one more. One more. Back? Yeah, this one. Yeah. He's in purple, Bill Murray's in neutral colors, and the girl he was abusing with his toxic masculinity is in red. Sometimes wow. I'm so good. I That mm-hmm. is a fantastic analysis. Yeah. And I, I mean, it makes sense. I, I totally understand that. I buy that for sure. That one was for you, Lutz. Happy fantastic. early birthday. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I threw this in there. I was trying to oh, figure yeah. out... Um, this is from a book that talks about color and film and the types of reds that can be used, right? So the red is known as the caffeinated color and there are powerful, lusty and defiant types of reds, anxious, angry, romantic. So again, stuff that we've touched on in the past, but I was just like looking at this and I'm like trying to figure out where it fit in. I guess there's a bit of multiple things. You have the angry and romantic side of it and lusty and powerful in there as well. So um, fantastic analysis, Josh. That is super interesting just about how, I guess how it really does over the course of the film change as he's changing and as his right. world is changing. Wow. Right. Like he's, he's in that girl's room just, uh, and this is even fun here because like he has to walk past his masculinity to open up her closet to look inside. Like, I mean, you could really start to pull that apart if you wanted to. And yeah. I believe, you know, with the, with the track record of Dustin and more important, uh, of Sydney, and more importantly, um, who just passed away? The production designer? Yeah. Peter Larkin? Peter Larkin. With Peter Larkin's track record, like, I believe that that's what they're trying to say. Like, I really do. Like, I feel like it was on purpose. Yeah. I buy it. I, I get it. I mean, if you told me that was it, I certainly understand it. So sorry about the uh, slight technical difficulty there, but, but yeah, so anyway, it was just, you know, the first part of that is about creating the look and feel and tone of a film. And then also how you can use the color to represent something. It was really, uh, and it's also totally different than what Goodfellas did, you know, so the the variety of uses for it, but uh, really cool that you picked up on that. Um, Awesome job. Totally makes sense. And what's up with that super hot uh, red blanket in the background? Uh, That is my rage for the fact that's my, workspace? 
that's my rage that um it's actually a cubs blanket and that's my rage that baseball is not happening right now yeah that's totally my, rage. my yeah. rage in it that's why i slowly <laughs> reveal it like every amount of red i have in my room right now there you go yeah. literally my pillow is red my <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah way to be anyway. toxic toxic masculinity austin <laughs> Anyway, yeah, so I mean, I'd like to discuss another color in the future here, but, uh, you know, at least we could see the, a lot of the reds from Goodfellas and Dorothy Sweet. or uh, Tootsie and, and see the difference there. Awesome. So, really cool. Right. Do you have anything well, you else? Know what, you know what I thought was interesting? Um, this was the same. Did you, you guys ever see the movie Bedazzled with Brendan Fraser and Elizabeth Hurley? No. Oh, man, it's so good. Well, this, is, this movie had the same writer as it, but if you haven't seen it, then it doesn't matter. But uh, that's like a classic 90s comedy. I thought you would like Josh because it's Brendan Fraser. Oh, I love Brendan Fraser. <laughs> but, um, but no. So, um, so what else do you guys? Any, any other thoughts? I mean, you know, while while you were watching it, Austin, no, anything that was cool I'm or stuck out? Or, yeah. That that whole conversation of red took out my argument and part of my brain. So, <laughs> <laughs> got nothing left for you, fella. No, no, it's all right. It's yeah, it's a lot. Uh, sorry to overwhelm you there. I know it's a lot. No, you're good. you're good. I just realized that Elizabeth Hurley is uh, Vanessa in uh, Austin Powers. Yeah, that makes me happy. All right. Uh, um, yeah. No, I mean, I think this was a great conversation about that. Do we want to do our little questions and stuff? Oh, look, yeah. Let me ask you this one one last question. I guess. Sure. That I so what did you guys think of the ending? I mean, she, she or he reveals himself in front of the whole TV studio that he's actually a man. And, um, you know, the ending scene is him catching up with Jessica Lang as himself. And they sort of talk about, you know, how she misses Dorothy. And he's like, well, she's still here. You don't have to miss her, blah, blah, blah. And they walk down the street and are sort of playful and all that kind of stuff. How did you feel about the ending? I mean, it's a little bit cliche to do the happy ending, but did, were you satisfied with it? Did you feel like it was a little forced, or what? What were your thoughts on the ending? But did about they? How they like she, how she kind of accepted Dustin Hoffman as a man, and was just like, "All right, let's go with it." Yeah, but they're not dating. Like it's no, not like there's this big kiss and like right. I love you. Like it's kind of just like he learned to be a better dude. I'm okay with that. Yeah, I think like I think the the easy way out would have been the big like Tom Hanks kiss at the end like I love you and then like you know they fade up and then you get the Tootsie theme song comes back and it's the slow tilt down on the house and he's making breakfast in the morning and the little mm -hmm. girls running around and they're a happy family blah 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 but they didn't do that they left it open ended I like that. There's did it certain... feel too easy? Like, did it feel like she kind of was just like, oh, okay, you know, I'll give it a shot. You know, I, I mean, it seemed like a really big betrayal that she just kind of thought about for a second and was like, all right, whatever. <sighs> yep. I'll get oh, into this when I touch my thoughts with it. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, man, I did not like this ending. <laughs> really? Oh, man. Um, you don't get any insight as to how Dustin Hoffman's character is doing. I mean, at the start, you think you do because he's drinking in a bar, but then you realize it's because that her dad goes to this bar. But, uh, like, what becomes of him as an actor? We know that he's going to go and do this play that he raised the money for, but she says that he's all the hot news now, but what? Like, you know, like... We just see this like defeated man, essentially. And I think that she shouldn't have take, like been friends with him after this. That is a huge betrayal to yeah. go through. There were how many proposals in this movie? Whatever happened to that shit? Yeah. Like, it's just so, it feels like they put a lot of emphasis on confusion and it virtually showed through the ending of this film because I, I was just like, no, like, don't, don't take him back. Like, don't be friends with him. He literally pretended to be a woman. Like, yeah, like imagine if this person that you got so close to over such a long period of time and like just took off the mask one day was like, oh, by the way, I'm a dude. Like, you yeah. would be like, out of shit. You would be like, I, like, we were sleeping in the same bed together. And, like, I was getting changed in front of you. And like, yeah. I'd call the police probably. <laughs> Dustin, I have something to tell you. 
Uh-oh. After all of our years of friendship. I'm a... No, I'm just a dude. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, seriously. Imagine if that happened. You're like, oh, I'm a chick. You're like, yeah. It's just, it's just to be like, finally. All right. Good. The search is over. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, I, like, I was happy with the ending because I like both of them and, like, I'm glad they got together. But, like, from a logistical, realistic standpoint, I'm like, no way, dude. Like, she would run for her life and, you know. It's crazy shit. or something. Yeah. So. I mean, I I understand your guys part of it and and I definitely agree with it. I do think though is at least a somewhat challenging ending because there wasn't the big like, you know, romantic gesture thing sure. at the end. So. Right. No, if they would if they would have done that, I would have been like totally out of it and been like right. no fucking way. This almost like a Woody Allen ending, right? Where it's like things aren't the worst, but it's also not the best it's just kind of uh, life moves on yeah yeah all right well let's do this uh what was your favorite thing in the movie oh hands down it's just dorothy michaels like as a character <laughs> i mean she's just so i mean I, and again like i wish they had shown how she developed and where she came from and how dustin became her but she was just so great like i love the way that she spoke and her attitude and, like he was so convincingly that woman you know it's like there was not a trace of dustin hoffman in dorothy michaels at least when i was watching and like i i really gravitated towards her so she was my favorite i mean jessica lang's my favorite but like dorothy michaels she was i just loved that character and that creation and wish we could have seen how it came to be uh apparently he spoke with a southern accent because he found when he did the southern accent his voice naturally transitioned to that higher register it's kind of interesting little yeah. bit there. I mean, yeah, Dustin Hoffman, he does have that very sort of like low, yeah. and low you know, so that tenor to his voice. But awesome. What did, you guys, what did you guys dig? Um, I think my favorite part of this is the uh, source for identity that we see a little bit of struggle where we see this toxic masculinity then to utterly chaos and confusion between the woman and the man personalities that he has to finally realizing that he was a piece of shit and that he understands how women feel. Like, I think that's the greatest part about this movie. Mine's very shallow. Mine is Surprise Bill Murray. There's nothing better (laughs) than Surprise Bill Murray. And when you get it, you're just like over the moon about it. And this movie had Surprise Bill Murray. I was just thinking while Austin was saying that, I'm like, you know what? I really wish I'd knew what happened to bill murray at the end there yeah. <laughs> what was bill like, murray doing like, I don't know what he's like is he happy what happens to that guy <laughs> but yeah that was that was a nice surprise least favorite thing in the movie the overuse of some songs in the soundtrack oh i know Interesting. I, damn tootsie song played every five minutes <laughs> like if they would have added a little more different like songs I would have been like, you know, like, you know, like dancing around, acting a fool and everything while watching it. But it's the same songs. Like, did they not just have the money to get like other or like, did they just make it a point that these are the two that we're going with? We're sticking with it. Because it's Interesting. run. The, ah, is that the Tootsie song, the run song? You guys know what I'm talking about? Run. Na, na, na. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think so. It's like three times in this movie. Like, and I get it enough. <laughs> yeah. And the, and the, like, I didn't even occur to me that, I guess this is my least favorite thing. The name, <laughs> Tootsie. Um, it didn't occur to me that the director was calling her Toots. I, I did not recognize, like, I didn't pick that up until, like, way later in the film. And I'm like, oh, okay. Wow, that's what Seems I- like a weak name, but all right. What about you? What do you got, Justin? What's your least favorite? Mm. I think um, I honestly think it's just not knowing where Tootsie came from and not knowing how she came to be. That bothers me a little bit. Like, it's just, it it didn't bother me when I was watching and it didn't take me out of the movie, but it's just like, I feel unsatisfied by not seeing how he goes from Michael Dorsey to Dorothy Michaels from a story standpoint. So I agree. Um, 
if you could recast Dustin Hoffman? Let's say a today. Let's 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 pick somebody today that you think could handle this with the uh, sincerity that Dustin Hoffman did, but also still deliver the humor. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, an odd. Well, Adam Sandler already did it in uh, the classic. <laughs> Jack and Jill. You guys ever oh. see Jack and Jill? <laughs> he plays a guy and his uh, sister, I think. Thank you for making me once again have nightmares tonight because I remember that movie. <laughs> <laughs> remember, remember in Ted when he's like, uh, "Yeah, we're watching uh, this movie, Jack and Jill. It's just, it's, it's unwatchable. <laughs> it's unwatchable." <laughs> um. Wow. Okay, I've got mine. I don't know if it's a good enough reason, but I'm gonna go with Bradley Cooper. Oh, Bradley Cooper. yeah. Yeah. Interesting. He, He'd make a pretty uh, woman. He has the capacity to we've seen in comedies to deliver that comical element while also being in very serious films and seeing, you know, how, you know, in, oh, wow. Wow. I totally forgot the movie with him and Lady Gaga. <laughs> Star is born. <laughs> Star is born. Thank yeah. you. Um, you see, like, how, like, sadness and depression like enact him so i think that he could definitely fill in while also proving a point plus it would be kind of interesting to see like what he would look like in drag i don't know how he would like pull it off put like a ponytail or something yeah well it's, it's interesting because he's such like a masculine guy like he's a very you know he looks like a you know he's got that very manly look to him but again dustin hoffman is i don't know if i'd consider him like a feminine looking no Person. Definitely a masculine. A no, masculine they did a fantastic dude. job with the makeup and the in the costume design to, you know, work around all that. Right, John? Justin. Uh, all right. Um, you know what? It's for me. I think I can't. I keep thinking of guys that are already sort of like feminine looking. You know, like I'm kind of on the opposite train. Like the two that I would think of were Ezra Miller and um, uh, Timothy Chalamet, who both already had like sort of feminine features. Like Ezra Miller, particularly who uh, has played The Flash on the, uh, 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 if you guys know. Yeah. He's in Perks of Being a Wallflower. And, like, he's a very, he's got a very feminine vibe to him. But, uh, so, I like, I was thinking more people who already, like, I could see in drag, not necessarily someone like Bradley, who's very, uh, you know, very hard to imagine in that role. Like, I was thinking more look and not character, I guess. Sure, more. sure. How about um, you? I think a lot of this guy, and I know that, unfortunately, I think most of his career is going to be a blockbuster after blockbuster type scenario, but I think Tom Holland would kill it. Tom Holland. Interesting. I think he has the ability to to approach it with the sincerity that he needs to, but also have a whimsical, fun aspect to it. Um, I just I think the world of this guy. I, think, I know he's he's super young, but I think he's really gonna do some amazing things. Uh, unless they in bring Hollywood. him on for an interview and he spoils the movie. <laughs> like that's the best part, right? Like that's that's why I think he'd be good at this is because he I think he genuinely loves his craft. I know I'm just busting. And he's head. excited about the movies he makes. And this one, you would have to be excited about. You would have to be like, yes, this movie was awesome. Yeah. which Dustin Hoffman was. So now that we're talking about this though, I feel like you have to have um, an actor who like Dustin Hoffman was 45. I think when he did True. this, role. you need an I older think you actor need someone who's older and like has a more emotional maturity and like someone who understands the world a little bit more. Like now after you and I have said our picks, I feel like, wait, we we're way too young. We need like Bradley is, we need to go on that end. All you right. Know? Hang on. Austin's right. Austin's right. Let me come up with, well, let me come up with somebody else. Um, I need somebody who's like a serious actor. Uh, I need somebody who can kind of like lose themselves in a role. Uh, somebody who can be a good guy and a bad guy. How about Joaquin Phoenix? Uh, you know, Joaquin Phoenix is good, but I was thinking Killian Murphy. Oh my God. Hey, you know Go! what? You know what? Tom Killian, Hardy Killian is bosom work. buddies, but they're in drag. Yeah. <laughs> If, they, if we could just take Killian and Tom and put them in the Jessica Lang and the Rob or in the Dustin Hoffman roles, you got yourself a movie. Set it in Ireland or in England, and they're in a street gang instead of being actors. Glad you're just... finally coming around in my way of thinking. Oh, oh wait, dude, 
wait a sec. How did we? How did neither of us come up with this? You know who would be actually genuinely be awesome for this role? Paul Rudd. Like, oh! so good. I'm not even making fun of you. He would be so good. He would be perfect. He's like the guy. I don't know. He I'm is. Not fun of you at all? He is my pick, actually. Man, he would be good. He's oh, he would be great. Like, man, Paul Rudd is where it's at. There it is. Him or Bradley? Well. Wow. Wow. <laughs> ah. Gen- being genuine here. And I'm I, feel, I feel really like today was a good day for me on the, uh, the smartness level. And then I said smartness level. So now right. it's less good. But I don't know. All right. Awesome. There are other questions. What do we got? Is that it? Do we got the numbers or we got any other ones? Uh, yeah. Give me a score. Um, I don't want to go first for this one. I've gone first how many times? <laughs> I'll go first. Yeah, you go first. All right. So last week was a three five. <laughs> Evil Dead. Uh by the way, fellas. again, I just want to bring up that uh this movie came out one year after the Evil Dead. So just a cool juxtaposition on like the totally different ends of the spectrum from the early right. 80s. But um Goodfellas, I think I had it like a nine one or a nine three or something like you that. You guys have been really high. You guys have both, I think, been like up there a good bit. I think like high eight or low nine. six or something like that for me. So um, I think, would I watch this movie again? Yeah. Would I, like, is this a, like, oh, my God, I need to own it? No. But if it was on TNT, I wouldn't turn it off. Um, so I think we're going to go with, like, a 5-5. Five, five. Like, dead center. Like, just a normal, like, fun movie I'd watch again. Or, like, uh, like you're showing five, five. it. Yeah. 5-5. Five, five. That's like an F. <laughs> That's like- that's like terrible. No, it's just like middle of the road. An F is like a, a zero. Didn't you give Evil Dead a 5-5? Five, five? No, Evil Dead was Austin a 3.5. Austin gave Evil Dead a 5-5. Five, five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. All right. You know how I feel about horror movies, so. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, Austin, you want to go? Yeah. I'm going to give this. Mm, okay. So my original score, let's say that I don't see the ending. My original <laughs> score is a 6-5. Okay. But after the ending, I'm going to give it a 6-1. Okay. Okay. The, the ending really, like, I mean, I wasn't taken out of it, but, man, it just left me wanting more. I get of, it. Like, what happened, so. Yeah. I get it. I respect that. Um, I think, for me, this movie is, like, a solid 7. Like, it's kind of like Josh said, like it's respectable and like the character of Dorothy Michaels is so iconic and so awesome. Like that's all that I love about it pretty much. And like outside of that, it's, you know, it's good background noise. Like Josh said, I agree with that completely. Like if it was on TV, I'd throw it on, yeah. you know, the commercials and just like keep it on while I was making popcorn or like doing whatever. But I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd necessarily like sit down and go through it start to finish you know, yeah, no, no, every know. outside of every, like, you know, five or 10 years. So uh, to me, that's like a solid seven. Like it's, it's pretty decent. I think this is the first time that my score has been lower than yours, Justin. <laughs> yeah, I think so. yeah, yeah, yeah. My highest, I think my highest was Mystic River, which was a uh, eight, five, I think. Ugh. So yeah, well, you guys you, have had, you yeah, guys have had, departed. That's all have, it is. How was that? Um, I think it was an eight. I had a good fellas. Yeah, because, yeah, 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 because yeah, 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 long. gangster movies are just, yeah, they're tough. They're work to get through. Too but, uh, long for him. Yeah. Um, all right. That wraps up Tootsie. What are we are getting, you guys? Next, Josh. Are you ready for next week's assignment? I was until you said it like that, and now I feel like I'm not. <laughs> all. Now I feel uh, like I'm already. Justin, I think, uh, I think that you will love it. We will be watching the perks of being a wallflower. Oh, oh the perks of being a wallflower. Uh, first off, it's a Paul Rudd movie. Uh, <laughs> Actually, just give. I'm gonna start it at a nine right now. But uh, Netflix just added it, and I saw it, and it made me smile. And I thought that'd be a good one to watch. So we'll do perks of being a wallflower, uh, an amazing book, and uh, we just mentioned all those actors too because I was gonna go with the Social Network, but then I saw oh. perks being on there, and I thought. That was fun too. Wait, have you guys seen Perks though? I have. Yeah. You have? Oh. 
Well, then let's do social network because I've never seen the social network. you never seen the social network? Oh, I'm my God. I'm the worst film student ever. Austin, have you seen social network? Bits and pieces, but not the whole way. All through. right, that's oh what my, we're doing. Oh, my God. Here we you go. Know, you know, the social network was ranked by pretty much everyone, including me, as the best movie of the decade for 2010s. Yes. Like, number one film. Dude, yes. there's so like the produ- it's David Fincher. So David Fincher, is amazing. The story of it is cool. I can't believe this, man. I'm so excited now. All right, all right. So, fu- so fucking good. Oh my god. <laughs> Here we go. All right. I I well I now I'm even like why did I even pick Perks of Being a Wallflower? No, uh, Perks of Being a Wallflower is great. Great. It's a fantastic film. But I figured you guys would have seen it already. So yeah, let's, Social Network sounds good, man. All right, Social cool. Network it is. Um, all right. Thank you for watching Thoughts from the Movies. Uh, I'm Josh L. Sass with Justin Luteran and Austin Moorhead. Uh, <laughs> I'm just so really, about this. I'm into that one. I'm ready to just get to work. I'm going to watch it right now. All right. All right. But no, yeah, thanks for joining, guys. It was a great conversation today. These have been awesome, and uh, glad we keep doing them. Hell yeah. Keep doing it as long as that quarantine's still going on. So <laughs> That's right. As long as, long as we're still inside, let's do it. <laughs> All right. Thanks for watching, everybody.